Running African, reuniting the African family for development. All right, we're going back to Kensington, where Roger Haspall is standing by as we rememory, uh, recollect, and uh, recall to mind the Emancipation Wars, celebrating Sam Sharp and those who fought and died and survived the Emancipation Wars of 1831-32. Flames of Freedom, Roger, it's back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kabu. Good morning again, everyone. We are here at the Kensington Historical Site here. Um, in uh, the, the area is Kensington, yes. and then of course we have Welcome Hall. This yes. particular zone yes. is Welcome Hall, as we are joined now by Noel Chong, a member of the Welcome Hall Citizens Association. I'm feeling welcome. Um, no doubt the name Welcome Hall also coincides with that. Well, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. And uh, you are the person I gather can give us some information regarding this particular site right here where we are. Uh, Based on what I'm seeing, apparently this could have been also one of those gathering areas of Mr. Shah. But um, this, this historical, give us a uh, synopsis about how this historical site came into being. The, the name Kensington means commanding view. Commanding view. Yes, and as you can see where we are, there's a lot of view. Yes, definitely. So, so on, the, on the top of the hill, we actually see the phone transmitter. There's a cemetery in that. Yes, okay. There's, there's yeah. a cemetery right there, and it have all the British settlers buried right there. Oh, so the British settlers are just about that's all, that's all, around two stone shows away. Yes, yes. Yeah. Just on the hill up, up that side. Yes, up the southern barrier. Yes, there's British settlers. Yes. Okay. They have around nine foundation of the building, the Great House, Kensington yes. Great House, where they used to dwell. They also have a large a hole around. 30 feet in diameter. Uh, what, a what? A hole a in hole. the ground. Or okay. 30 feet in diameter. Yes. That's where they used to hold the slave. In oh, the like a dungeon. Something yes. like a dungeon. Yes. You know, so yes. Yes. They can't escape from the hole. Yes. Very they put stuff over here. Yes. Mm -hmm. To keep them in the, in the ground. Mm -hmm. So, where Tolo Castle is, is yes. it's either that settlement. The, and it's not far from here, Tolo no. Castle. No. And I gather there are still some ruins yes, here. They are big. Stonewall building, yes. foundation, mm -hmm. part of it there. Mm -hmm. So, and it was a settlement also. Yes. Because they look straight in Montego Bay from that end. Oh, you could see, you can see. Yes, you can see what I'm in I'm sent it. So, I can oh. see what you learn. And that's why you can see up in St. Elizabeth. Because, I mean, driving from coming in, it's, I gather it's 11 miles from Montego Bay where we are. And it was a, <laughs> quite a long drive for me because we're driving especially slow. But you say you can see the city of Montego Bay from there. Yes. Wow. Yes. So this site now, tell us about it. This site here mm. is where up at the part of Greenwich Hill. Yes. This have a little building where some shop a meeting place. Mm. So the whole area is at the site? Yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And he planned, very planned the rebellion. Yes. The lady. Within this zone? In this zone. Okay. Yes. yes. So plan B was plan plan B was mm -hmm. to get William Nipper to them to, to see they get negotiate there. That's what the Baptist minister did. Yeah, no. Yes. William Nib I think he was a, a lawyer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are from England. Yes. Mm -hmm. he, he tried to get the freedom for the slave. Yes. And they have an inauguration ceremony at Sartersville Baptist Church. Yes. That's down the road. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he did he never win because the plantation owners they, they, they uh, jam cut, on. cut a network of road in the highland, yes. build it, set up the farm, mm -hmm. and put the slaves so they don't work back their money yet. Okay, so they can't make them go free. Yes. So they have to work. So they have to use William Nibba to sell out. Yes. That's who the, the plantation owner. That's yes. Who are, and so and the settler. Yes. Settler. So yes. all the plantation owner from Shulani, Westmoreland, and over in St. James, all of them get a chat at the Baptist Church to hear the house come up what take place in England. Yes. So through that take place now, mm -hmm. And if they never get their freedom, they go to Plan B mm -hmm. to light the church, Kensington Great House, the trash house, yes, and and the Great House, mm -hmm. and they send the signal to Palmyra, where they continue the rebellion. Mm -hmm. And Palmyra is a, um, a couple miles from yes, right to mm -hmm. Rosa, Rosa side. Yes, because you can see over there. You can see Rosa. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So 
they continue with so Tolo Cash will run and barely escape on top of Saturday and say she he barely survived mm-hmm. along with his with his, his wife, wife and, and, and yes. family, yes. yes. Bruised and battered. Mm-hmm. So when they spread the news in the organization, in the sermon, mm-hmm. everybody that in expanse as them everybody run in different directions. Yes. And they carry the news and everything continues the same way. It's spreading mm-hmm. until the eighteen thirties everyone. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that gathering up at the church where everybody meets, to, 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 it was that was the first meeting where they were hoping to hear some good news. Yes. Out of England. Yes. But it never worked at no. the time. It was the good news for the planters. It was good news for the planters. They that's love that. Yes, that's yeah, because they want, they want to squeeze out everything out of the, the, the poor little African them around here. So good news to them, but bad news to we. Yes, it's late. And we went to plan B. Yes. It was a plan. Yes. Our way to freedom. Yes. And uh, here we are today. So, right here now, this um, thing. Why well, you can't tell me about it? It's like this thing. Yeah, man, this, this, this historical, this information right here. They have the, the, the whole site itself yes. right here. Yes. I mean, it was founded by the tourism product, um, tourism product development. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, it, Mr. Bartley, it probably was... Yeah, Go on. Mm-hmm. It's Mr. Kelly Initiative, or oh, yeah. Korean, right. Peter Dan Carter Henry. Historian. Yes, Dan yeah. Carter Henry, the uncle of DJ Pattison. Yes. Yes, they come with the history along with his association and things, and they make the history more plain and known to the public here. Yes. yes. And put up the notice board and things. Mm-hmm. So because even red citizens in this era mm-hmm. who, who migrated or leave, yes. or older one, don't know the history. Yeah, I can just imagine a lot of people who we, from this yes, place never yes. know nothing. Yeah, they don't yeah. know they have some cut stone building and they know some of them know yes. the building, but yes. they didn't know the history. Yes. But thanks to Mr. Kelly yes. and our historian, mm-hmm. they brought it to life. Mm-hmm. Yes. And put up this solo castle where we have the annual festival two times a year. The Emancipation Village. Yes. They, they build that thing along with the Citizens Association. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bob, I just think thing that... that it's a dream, you know, it's something that has great potential. Yes. Because in terms of heritage celebration and yes. heritage yes. tourism, mm-hmm. which was why the GPD code would have supported this and funded yes. Yes. this monument in this position so that everybody was passing through. All right? I mean, if you were down Tolo Castle, you wouldn't see it. Yes. But as you pass through, you see this mm-hmm. monument, and it reminds you about that Kensington was where it all began. Mm-hmm. And it was, and it's a very important location. So it brings you in your department holy ground right now. Yes, yes. definitely. Um, the, 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 the portrait of, of Mr. Shah, it, 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 how accurate? <laughs> how accurate would you say? Oh, I know where you're going with that. Where no, no, I don't know where you're going with that. I don't know if there were... Course, no, 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 Elder, yeah, right, yes. So that there is an impression of Sam Sharp as an older person, yes. But do you realize that Sam Sharp was about thirty-one years old when he died? Very young, very young. I mean, thirty-one, yeah. Yeah, but, yes, it's true. When you said that is I think he's a old. Ah, man. I think a lot of too, yeah. can think about Sam Sharp as an old man, yes. And we say Daddy Sharp, yes. You know, yes. But he was born out somewhere around 1800, 1801, yes. and he died in 1832. Mm-hmm. So the man was like 31, 32 years old. Yes. And uh, in terms of Sam Sharp, he, he, you would have said that he was one of those who had a little more privilege. Yes. Because, yeah. He, he, was, he, was, he, he had still a slave, but he, yeah, he had, had a little more privilege. Because yes. he, he had the name of, he had the, go on, he had the name of his, of his master. Yes. Which was interesting. Well, all that we have a name, old man. No, we have the surname, surname. <laughs> yeah, him have the full name. <laughs> the full name. I want you know you know you know you know, you know, you know, you know, you know what I, I want, yes I want to put in and 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 I know we call ourselves because still en, still en, I would say still enslaved you know 
Uh, yeah, and, right. and, 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 and carrying, and yeah, carrying we, the, we should keep that. Yes, we man, I'm carrying that. the name of the enslaver. Yes, I'm yes. carrying the name of the enslaver. But yes. Gabu, yes. I think it may have been the only city. All of us got the surname of the planter of the plantation. But I can't think of any other situation where so one enslaved African got the name, the full name of the plant of the of the enslaver. Well, you, but, but I'm sure that that must be replete in history, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know, but I'm sure that that is all over. <laughs> you mean the full yes, name somewhere? Yes. No, I'm just saying, I mean, I mean the, 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 the enslaver was that vicious to take your name totally and just give you one name, you know, if I do, whether it's his or, or, or anybody else is in his family. Yeah, I, know, I, yeah. I, I, I yeah, am thinking. Enough. You know, but, yeah. but I understand the point that you're making, um, Sid, that, you know, yeah. Sam Sharp's name was stolen from him. Right. And, and that he was given, you know, the full name of, of, of oh. a vicious enslaver. So you, I hear you pointing out the grave sites and the cemetery and so on, and I'm biting my tongue. <laughs> I know, I know. That's, you know I'm biting, I'm biting, that's why I'm not saying anything much. I'm biting my tongue, Roger. <laughs> yeah, yes, I can just imagine. Yeah. Yes. You do, silent. You do, silent. Yeah. But, but yes. no, it's yeah. not something to say now. No, yeah. Sam Sharp, he had a special privilege, but he was a special person. Yes, yeah, we'll get into that. Yes. Special person, but he also had a privilege. Yes, mm -hmm. he also was privileged. Yes, yes, because when the slave was not governor, yes. he was the first one to come, he speak to them, get them to do Christianity, and yes. get them to obey that they don't run after the plantation. And learn verses and, and learn to read. and Yes, and, and, yes. So, so Sam Sharp now, he, he, he was a preacher, he do psychology, yes. he have language skill. Yes. African come with enough diverse languages yes. and he was able to communicate with them. Yes, a multiplicity of um, dialects and yes. so on. Yes. Yes. He, was yes. a, he was a special human being you know, and talented. Talented. Yes. And and he as you said, he was not he was a privileged African in that he was not given the full enslavement of others. Yes. yes. He was in the great house with him. Boss, with his, his enslaver yes. working there. But, 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 is there any privilege in, in being enslaved? I, I, no, I mean, no, just no, different, no, different no, degrees. There are different degrees of enslavement. Yes. So let, let, let us say he had less mm. vicious situations. Yeah, to say he had privilege. But he also felt the pain at the same time. Yeah. And but he felt the pain of his, yeah. Yes. And he felt always that regardless of what situation he was in, he was always conscious that he was not free. And, yes. and that he should not be owned by anyone. Yes. He was always conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And that could never leave his psyche. No matter what he did. Hence, hence the special person he was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Right, Gabo? Yeah, I, I, am th I am thinking myself that, you know, even when we talk about Christianity and, and all of that and talk about the role that Sam Shah played um, in, in, the, in, the, in the, the Emancipation Wars and the fact that he was a deacon, I think that we, we ourselves have to understand this as, you know, coming from, from, from the mind of a liberator, using the very same tool of enslavement um, to, 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 to liberate. Yes. yes. You know, in other words, what do you have in your hand? You know, what do you have in your hand? Use it. And so if it's, right. if it's a Bible that he had in, in his hand, then the Bible speaks of freedom. Right. And the Bible speaks of liberation. The Bible speaks of liberation. You know, so, you so. know he, 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 that, that element, when he, when he, he, he his Christian calling, led him, led him into looking at the cry for setting the captives free. The liber, what is called liberation theology. The whole use of of the principles of Christianity, the principles of the Bible, as a part of the liberation of the human being. Mm -hmm. And some of us speak of it in spiritual terms only. Yeah. Some of us speak of it um, in, in, in only in terms of we are free to worship. Yes. But we don't realize that it is a total freedom. Yes. It's what Garvey spoke of when he spoke of masters, masters of our own destiny. Straight. The right to choose the right to be. And Sancha was about that. Yes. And can you can you imagine straight, can you imagine up. Sydney at this time? I mean, now we're talking about um, the twenty first of of December and um, things coming to a head on December twenty seventh. Can you imagine that how the heights of a strategizing that would have happened um, up to this point and that how the, is, and, and the plans that would have been laid um, uh, by now by that's, today? That's, a, that's, a, that's amazing. 
when you think mm-hmm. there were no cell phones, there was no phone, all, all we had was the, 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 the indomitable drum was our, was our communication tool. And when you think of the large expanse, as, as we look around, as Roger says, and seeing the hills all over the place, mm-hmm. and then we realize that Sam Sharp and all the others had to be moving from through these hills in the middle of the night, free electricity, all of that before computer, all of that, and strategizing, getting mm-hmm. Africans yes. as far as Hanover yes. and other places. Westmoreland. Westmoreland. Coordinating. No, coordinating. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's an, yeah. it's, an, it's an amazing concept to, to even con- think about. And that shows you also how the seriousness at which they took it, because here they know that a lot of things at stake here, I mean, the life at stake, everything at stake, and they just determine that, look here, we, it this has, generation, has to go. this generation, this generation right here in Jamaica, we are going to stop yes. to pay for it. it. It has to go. And uh, they paid for it, and we celebrate their lives now because of that. Yeah. Yeah, so st- right here at the historical site here in, in Kensington, um, the, we are standing behind the, the symbolic flame. Uh, which is burning. Will it be burning throughout the course of the world? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And this is and something similar to what the lady threw into the trash house. Right. And when you say trash house, what, 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 what's not been a trash house? A trash house yes. is a house where they, they, they store the, the, the cane trash. Yes. They use it for fuel to, to, to boil in sugar. Oh. So everything else, everything from that cane plant yes. um, did something. Yeah. yeah. So they keep it in a dry place. So that, is that what one is? Is that what I call no, ethanol and all this? No, no, we call it. That, yeah. So that is the original ethanol. <laughs> <laughs> so the trash house no, was the ethanol house. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> interesting, interesting. And uh, so she decided that that was it. We have burned that and we're sending a signal. So you're saying now, oh, there's where the store. Um, for the fuel. Explain the other, 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 other things where that plant could have, what, what it done, what it did. They, they boil the sugar. Mm-hmm. So they, they will have different types of cane, but they have a, a mill. It's a, they are on 30, around 30 feet as in diameter. The area of space, the lever. Mm-hmm. When they pack the stone and make it round, and they put the around 4 feet by 4 feet in the middle, they have a little cane mill. Yeah. So they have the horse or the mule yeah. going around in that circle. To, to stretch the cane and it's piece of the juice. Okay. They were now a big part, they call it a copper pot. Uh-huh. Yes. So, so the near beside that. Mm-hmm. So you have two, you see the, 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 the terrain of the place? Mm-hmm. So they don't have one big mill. They have a lot of them all over mm-hmm. and different plantations. Yes. 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 Speaking with Noel Chong, a member of the Welcome Hall Citizens Association, and we have Mr. Sidney Bartley, the coordinator of the whole Sam Sharp celebrations. Um, three events. Tell us about the first one that took place at uh, Sam Sharp. Yeah. College. Oh, that was marvelous. Um, it's uh, it's a Sam Sharp lecture. Yeah. We decided that it was important to start a Sam Sharp lecture series mm-hmm. so that at, at, on this occasion, the Sam Sharp Teachers College has been involved. Yeah. One of the things that comes out of the vision of Mr. Kelly, one of the things that we're doing is ensuring that we bring all the elements of Sam Sharp together. Yes. So Sam Sharp Teachers College is very involved. Yes. They'll be at the service today as well. Yes. So that lecture went on Dr. Simon Clark. Yes. Um, was the lecturer. Mm-hmm. He did a good job. Students came from Maldon, just up the road here, Springfield, mm-hmm. Anchovy, Cambridge. A lot of students came. And if it was a student, yes, for secondary students and college students, yes, and so we, that was started this year with Simon Clark. It was um, it was very well. Was like Dr. Simon Clark is one among the best, and he spoke about the ele- various elements of Sam Sharp's life mm-hmm. and related to the kind of life that students were now having. So it was very relevant to them. Yeah. So so he he brought he brought that realness back yes. to this generation yes. about what yes. Sam Sharp was all about. Yes. Because ignorance is a problem. But lack of knowledge is a real issue. Yeah, because, no because, because you, you'll also have um, some people who, even from all these zones who 
might have bought into the home that's I'm sharp to you. Know. They don't people don't know. Yeah, yeah. You don't know. Mm-hmm. You see, and what you, and that's that kills us all the time. Yes. The people die because of lack of knowledge. You know what I mean? Yes. So we've got to fuel knowledge. So the concept of the you know, that lecture was to do that. Mm-hmm. All right? And so that happened. Yes. And it was very good. Sam yes. Sharp Teachers College hosted it. Mm-hmm. Thanks to the principal, Dr. Pinnock, and yes. his staff, like Ms. Graham. Yes. Very and well. this year, basically, was a, it is the first of an expanded Sam Sharp celebration. Okay. Because this uh, celebration has been going on for years. Yes. Through Mr. Kelly mm. and, the com- and the Welcome All Citizens Association. Mm. They have been carrying it on for years. When you talk to the president, mm. he can yeah, tell man. you some of the things that have been happening. Mm. But what we're trying to do is to take it to another level yes. so that it can become what we, what the revision of the... Of of Minister Kelly is that it could become a major heritage tourism but of attraction, course. Yes. and that the community can gain uh, gain income yes. from from the pro- from projects like these heritage cultural heritage tourism. Art. Yes. So 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 Irie has to be in on it. Let me talk it loud <laughs> forever and forever to ensure that. All the people, so that later on people come from Africa, from U.S., all about at this time of year to welcome all to see the, what, has, what, some, what is about Samsha. Well, you have our word. Irie is the people's station. Irie is, is the station. One thing for the people, we are here for the people. I know. Yes, Mr. Chuck. I wanted to know that all the freedom war took place. In mm-hmm. South St. James, Maroon Town is like four miles. You can see those mountains right up there. Oh, what's the Maroon, Maroon Town? Town. Yes. Up here, yeah. Okay, that's where the Maroon Rebellion takes place. It's the Hojo and Nanyan. Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. 17. So, so after, um, after this district here, we, 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 that will be. Yeah, you're, you're we, going to be in Maroon Town. Maroon Town. Yeah. Blackstaff. That's, that's that interesting name. Blackstaff. You, you, you want to highlight us about that? Yes. I do. I'm, I'm, that. I'm going to have to take a break. I'm going to have to take a break, uh, Roger. Not a problem. So, so hang Not on to Blackstone. We'll take a break and we'll be right back with Roger yes. Fall and the team there in uh, Kensington, St. James. Today is the 21st of December. You know, it marks a year exactly, one year exactly since the passing of Richard Hart. And let's stop to acknowledge that for a minute because a lot of what we know about uh, Sam Sharp, about the Emancipation Wars, research done by Richard Hart himself. So it's a year exactly today that Richard Hart passed, 21st of December. It's 2014, he passed last year. All right, we're going to take a quick break, come back, and rejoin. Happening this morning in Jamaica, February 1831, the enslavers, the colonizers, the enslavers approved legislation to reduce the number of uh, uh, free days following Christmas from uh, three to two. And according to the work of Richard Hart, many enslaved Africans were able to read English, and news of anti-slavery campaign in Britain resulted in an atmosphere of expectants who were members of Baptist churches in Western parishes. On June 3, 1831, a proclamation in the name of King William IV was issued, refuting such claims. It was not widely publicized in Jamaica till December 22, 1831. The plan for a rebellion to commence after Christmas 1831 was conceived and organized by Samuel Sharp, 31 years old, enslaved African on Croydon Estate in St. James. And you've heard and you've been hearing all morning that Sam Sharp was a Baptist lay preacher referred to as a daddy or as a ruler at a meeting. And that's that, that's the title for, much for the churches, eh? Out of a church, it's daddy or ruler. Now, at a meeting at Retrieve Estate in St. James, Sam Sharp had all present bound themselves by oath not to work after Christmas as slaves, but to assert their claim to freedom and to be faithful to each other. After Christmas, bound yourselves by oath not to work as enslaved Africans, but as free men, understanding yourself as free men and women. The strike, the, the strike was the most important organizational factor in Sam Sharp's revolutionary plan. 
On Thursday, December 27, 1831, the last night of a three-day Christmas festival. A few hours before the scheduled strike. Fire at Kensington. And this, of course, being the signal. 16 of our estates followed. Talking about flames of freedom. Fire at Kensington. And this is where Roger Hasfall is at Kensington on December 21. As we rejoin him, we're hearing the singing in the background. Roger, you can tell us what's happening there. Yes, um, they're drumming up a, a little chant here by the rivers of Babylon. And um, it's going well. Uh, headed by Chief um, Choir Leader, Mr. Bartley. And of course, we are joined now by other members of the community coming in. More and more coming in. Uh, they have just put up the banner regarding the celebration that is to come on on December 27, while what you spoke about. Still have here Mr. Noel Chong, a member of the Citizens Association, and we were speaking about Flagstaff. That's the name that, 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 that struck a bell, because um, it has some significance to do with the British settlers and the NCAA. And Noel Chong, you want to tell us about that? Yes. I said it's very pleasant. Yeah, there's a phone transmitter. Yes. Of near, there's a cemetery near beside it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Where they buried the British settlers, the, 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 the soldiers yes. died in the, in the Maroon War. Yes. The British soldiers died. Yes. Okay, yes. like, so the Maroon War took place there, mm-hmm. and the soundtrack would be left out there. They only have the mm-hmm. for the whole country. Yes, yes, yes. So Flagstaff took the name out of the British. No, the British, after, it was the Maroon Town. But after the war, mm. the, the British, they, they make a, 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 a barrack, they make something up here, and they have a hospital before the British settlers, soldiers, mm. they, 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 they stay there while they, they move the, the maroon from there to a Hong Kong. Yes. So they stay there, a fort, they build a fort there. And the fort, okay, the fort over there. At Flagstaff. Yes, yes. So they put the big guns on the hills up and the and nothing. You're talking about the cannon, the cannon and, and thing. so on. Yes, yes. So they have one there. mile and thing for the people. Mm-hmm. That's it. And that's around a mile from here, so? No, that's around five miles. Oh, further up. Okay, okay, okay. Um, we have other people standing by to speak with us. We also have Osborne Johnson. He's the former president of the um, Welcome Hall Association. A man who can provide us with a lot more information regarding Mr. Samuel Sharp and the role he played in liberating us. That we could be here this morning through the airways of IRFM celebrating the life of this great Jamaican, a man who gave his life for the freedom of millions of people. And uh, Osborne Johnson, the former president, is with us. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, sir. Mm-hmm. And how long were you president? Just for two years. Just for two as, years. As president. Yes. So you were with the movement from, from its exit. Yes, yes, yes. So, December 27th. Yes. Yes. That, incidentally, that would have been after Christmas and... Uh, and Boxing, and Boxing yeah. because Boxing Day would have been celebrated at that time. So the slaves were to come back because normally that's when the, 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 the plantocracy would have given them some time off, right? Yeah, but the important yeah. thing about that part mm. is that, mm. as we all know, Christmas and Boxing Day, Boxing Day gets its name from the day that you open up your gifts. That yeah. So... And that day, the slave master would be secret within their own domain. Yes. And so the slaves would have like a day off on that day. Yes. So the day after that, mm-hmm. they still wouldn't be out there on the field just as yet. Mm-hmm. So that's why they organized that day for the whole revenue. No, hold on, let's stick up in. Boxing Day was the day that they organized. That's what you said? No. What am I going to say? The yes. day after Boxing Day. The day after the 27th. After, after Tunisia. Okay. Because they should have returned back to the respective 
they wouldn't they would yes. say after because okay. the boxing there is the play that the masters would have right here they yes and so instead of coming out on the next day yes it would be a little lap okay so they are used to that type of oh situation so that's why that day was planned yes. so they so they were expecting them to come out on the 28th then yes twice no they know that unlike on the 28th yes. would be full results at first yes so the 28th yes. so 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 the rebellion started on the 27th that's right that's right okay so everything just mash up from there today yes but they are they were look they were looking for them everybody to come back on the 28th yes full results yes but that never happened it's because as you all know it yes. does work he was preparing from quite some time ago yes but he's big yes. up and down all over the year at the fields and terrain yes. of this one yes yes mm-hmm. so in terms of of, of that now so how long was the rebellion it was about what was it? I think some part I used to say it was two days, some say it was three days. But as we all know how it works, in those days, the days couldn't write anything yes. for themselves. Right. So what we have to go by is what the same master writes. Okay. And, and what they do. What about the oral tradition that, that travels the truth as well? In terms of oral, the oral history, but we the people, we still have to imagine and know what happened. Yes. Because if we look what at the important part of the history, is that in those days, yes. everybody was born. Yes. And can you imagine, just like a pastor house, yeah, man. property, yes. yes, the own, yes. and me and you, your property. Yes, and then we realize, yes. we realize that. When a man has his property at home, his pastor, he lets go the cow. Yes. But in those days, the, the space was clean. They were mm. let go. So, so the cow never changed, the goat never changed, but, 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 but the man changed. changed. Yes. So as a result of that, shop of slavery. Yes. Uh, and Sam Sharp was the man with the little freedom because his father, their father, was one of the slave masters. Mm. And his mother was a slave, so he grew up and he did all, everything. He the side of the slave and he did the side of the So Sam Sharp, Sam Sharp himself then would have been, um, in those days, did I call him Mulatto? No? So, he, he, his father was white? No. No, no, that's why, that's what, no, that's, that's, that's why, that's what I'm trying to get from you now. He's just saying that his father was one of the slave masters. Oh, then that's why he had the opportunity to work within the house because his mother was 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 not was working in the house also you know. his mother you have a wife or a still food eh? i don't know I, I mean i'm just asking because it's about to look as if he has a, a total and another interpretation yes. So, yes apparently then there could be some in a different interpretation as to who some there was who, who there some is a father is different interpretation because all we have to go by is what was in the archives and yes. that was what was written by the slave master and okay. not by the slaves. Yeah. But we have to realize what it is like mm. to be in slavery. Yes. Looking at those people. Mm. Chain on your foot. Mm. And you only you only do what you are told. Yes. And those people are not likely to come and write things as it is. Mm. But if you notice most of the Sam Sharp history yes. was not recorded, you know. Definitely. Not recorded. These things will get left out because the things that happen, the things that happen, the masters are not proud of it, you know. They don't want... But they should be ashamed. They are more than ashamed. They should be ashamed. And that's but why a lot of the history is left out. All that we have is what is written in the archives. Mm-hmm. And that is not... That don't tell well. Mm. For the people, the slaves, the descendants of Sam Sharp, yes. mm. we have no real good reason to understand what is there. Mm. I'm speaking here with Mr. Osborne Johnson, the former president of the Welcome Hall Citizens Association. We still have Noel Chung with us. 
um, Noel has some something for us in regard of an oral history through poetry. And um, he can enlighten us where that is concerned, tell us a little history through a poem about back in the day. Africa, Africa. Africa was a free land where our four parents used to work and pay on. But some of the black man was corrupted by the white merchants. So they catch them brother and sisters and sell them as slaves. Yes, they were slaves, but now we are free. No more slavery. They run them down, then catch them, and then lock them up. The Kerman tea from Ghana. The Mendigos from Senegal. A whole lot of them from Africa. They face a lot of hardship coming across the Atlantic. A lot of them perish on the slave ship. The rich don't make for them. I them up, them line them up and shine them up. Ready to sell them and distribute them. Then say the one with the broken and him a B class. The one with the cut put him a B class. The one will look smooth and spotless. Then if he step cross, he a A class. 40% of the British economy was built by slavery. In 1838, slavery was abolished. The white man gets a repatriation fee. But until today, the black man only get apology. The black man only get apology. Yes, that's all, that's all right, that's all right. Mr. Johnson, so yes. you're two years old. I mean, tell us about that that, that, that period in, 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 in which you, you know, played your role. The two years that you are talking about is just as president of the city plateau. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened? I play my part in the development of the Sam Sharp site. That was over some, what, oh, 10, 12 years ago. Where is that? Down there. Down, down, down at down this yes. Castle. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think that is what you really want to yes, hear about. I want, yes, I'm getting there, but now I want yes. you to tell me about that. Because, yeah. I mean, you, you, you went there, you did some work. So uh, so there have been some rehabilitation in terms of some, some stuff down there. You want to tell me about that? In the beginning, yes. There was just bush mm -hmm. and just the uh, little remains of the stones that were there left. Yes. But over many years, from the time of the burning of the trash house, yes. that place was never... It, it was there, but no one really realized the exact spot yes. on which it exists. Yes. Uh, and so we had a vice president in the name of Don Carter Henry, yes. who was an historian, and he went through the archives and, and find the exact spot. And so then we went down there and cleaned up the land, remove all the bushes and so, and be able to identify the exact spot where the trash house was. Okay. And he said, and there was where the development of the site really begins. So tell me about, uh, more about, about what is there now. No, at present, it is an ongoing project we're yes. working on. Yes. At present, we have the, we have the, the bathroom, the it is bathroom. finished. The bathroom, the yes. completion and changing room. You have the seating area, we finished a long time, and the stage area, they go to the country. Seating, they have parking lot. They have the water coming and they have the part where they sell and where people gather up for the function annually. And it is situated on land donated by Dr. Agri Iron to the oh. citizen association. The land belongs to Dr. Agri Iron. Oh. Yeah. Yes, the old property. Okay. See, what happened? You know. Yes, yes. In those days, yes. when, they, when they sell out the land, Yes. And that's the new land owners don't even realize what is it they have. Yeah, I can just imagine because, I mean, for such a historical um, site that does that. It's, it's like you yeah, have gold, I don't even know. So he, yeah. he blessed that because he rent out the place. At and all his all stuff. Yes. His parents, yes. they rent out the place and have people planting things yes. you know, yes. and it, doing farming and it, even without realizing what it was. Yes. Uh, uh, and it was a church in those days, Baptist church, yes. with 
who organized the removal stone. Yes. That were there. And helped to build the Spring Street Baptist Church. Yes. Yes. Here we are in Kensington, St. James. We are at the Kensington Historical Site. And of course, just within half mile or so, we have the Tolo Castle, um, which was burned on December 27th. And uh, here we are celebrating um, the work of, of those brave people who helped to liberate Jamaica. And one of the, and and one, that. And one of the things yes. it seems to me, Roger, that we probably have to, uh, to consider even as we continue to celebrate Sam Sharp and Joe. Um, remember the emancipation wars to recall them is actually to say also that we have to look at the names of some of these places you know what that still carry bear the names of the enslaver and uh, and then and then where their graves are that really and truly these graves are to be spat upon not to be not to be <laughs> not, not, not 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 to be shown as part of any heritage of anything it's like you know you know as we, we yeah. I, I i can't envision the Jews, I can't, I can't envision the Jews, for example, uh, yes. you know, immortalizing the graves of, of the Nazis. I don't see that yes. happening. I think it's only in, in, in our history as black people that we have, if you go to Seville, we have a situation where the graves of the enslavers are in marble and so on, and the graves of those who are, you know, fought for, for freedom and those who are enslaved, um, you know, you can hardly identify. And, and yes. also we retain the names. We retain the names of the enslavers. Um, Roger, I'm going to need about 50 minutes from you, five zero minutes, as we um, go to the Sam Sharp lecture. Um, this Sam Sharp lecture was carried in um, on November 5, 2006, and this was delivered by uh, Arnold Bertram. So I, I want about 50 minutes from you, five zero, close to an hour, um, before we rejoin you to actually carry the lecture. But I hear the singing in the background. You can tell me what's happening there. Yes, yeah, so all right now, more people are gathering, and of course, they are having um, the chant. I mean, sometime immemorial, it's with those um, chants, I mean, by the rivers of Babylon and Hamid Bedo and all those things. So it's a nice little gathering, and it's going all the time. Drums coming in, more people coming, more singing coming in, and it, 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 it's really growing as we speak right now, all right, right here at the historical site. Oh, that sounds really good, and we encourage persons to come in, to come uh, to go to Kensington, be a part of what's happening there on the, on the hills, um, of, in the hills of St. James. IFM will be there until 10 o'clock, Roger will be there until 10 and probably be beyond that. Uh, so, so be a part of that, go out and be a part of that. We're going to take these Sam Sharp lectures, we remember and we call and remember um, Daddy Sam Sharp, and, and then we return to uh, Kensington, where Roger Hasfall is standing by. Is that okay with you, Raj? Not a problem. I'm keenly listening to that lecture. All right. Thank you so much, my brother. Okay, Roger Hasfall on location in Kensington. Roger, give, give us a little bit of the music. Go closer to the music. We can get a little bit of the singing. A little bit yes. of the singing there. He needs to up your voice a little. <laughs> and, and we have to have the already audience hearing this chant. And I want you to understand that this was started by the three women slaves after the, the end of the revolution. They, that's all they could do was dancing and singing their chant all around. And so this is why the, the descendants of the Samshah still have this tradition, even up to today. Yeah, this is what this is all about. Yes, indeed. So I hope you hear it. For a little while, Kabu? Yes, I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. Songs of Liberation, right. Songs of Liberation down there in Kensington. And as a community gathers, we ask you to gather also. And uh, we're going to go to the Sam Sharp Lecture where we broadcast the Sam Sharp Lecture, then we return to Kensington. So, Roger, we return to you in 50 minutes. The African Family for Development. All right, at this time of the year, as Pan-Africanists and Africans in Jamaica, we remember the Emancipation Wars, 1831-32, and uh, Sam Sharp and those who fought and died with him uh, in Jamaica. Uh, uh, many years ago, we, uh, in part of our IRFM's In Search of series, uh, part of our 
lecture included the Sam Sharp lecture when we went in search of Sam Sharp. That was in November 2006. The lecture at the time was delivered by Arnold Bertram. Going to be carrying a rebroadcast of that before we rejoin Roger Hasfall in Kensington. Thank you very much. I would like to dedicate this lecture to Richard Hart for his pioneering scholarship on the contribution of African Jamaicans to their struggle for freedom and social justice. Richard Hart was among the first to see the organic link between the building of the national movement and the process of public education through which the Jamaican people could draw inspiration from their own history and their own heroes. His monumental labors in this field remain unparalleled. I would also like to, in this dedication to include my wife Claire, my children Gillian and Richard, and especially my two grandsons, Elijah, Asher, Bertram Levy, and Joshua Richard, Joseph Bertram. I would specifically like to commend the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, and in particular its chairman, Professor Vereen Shepherd, for placing her scholarship at the service of the Jamaican people. The partnership forged with IRFM and which has led to the In Search of series represents a major landmark in our understanding of the historical process. The energy and commitment of the staff at IRI, led by Andrew Williams Green, has been extremely commendable. Now, Sam Sharp. Samuel Sharp, designated National Hero of Jamaica, first came to the attention of the colonial authorities in the year he was tried, convicted, and executed for organizing and leading the Emancipation Rebellion of 1831. This rebellion, which began on December 27th, involved close to 60,000 men and women, the majority enslaved from 300 plantations, pens, rural settlements and urban holdings. From its center in St. James, it spread first to Trelawney, Westmoreland, Hanover, Manchester and St. Elizabeth. Its effects were felt in the two parishes at the eastern end of the island, St. Thomas and Portland. Despite all this, at the height of the rebellion, considerable ignorance prevailed among the authorities as to the identity of Sam Sharp. None of them knew him. Hence the imprecision in the proclamation by the governor, the Earl of Belmore, on the 3rd of January, 1832, which offered a reward for the apprehension, and here Sam Sharp is described. One general ruler, Sam Sharp, or Tharp, alias Daddy Ruler Sharp, or Tharp, director of the whole rebellion, and styled also preacher to the rebels, belonging to Croydon Estate, St. James. To add to this confusion, the manuscript notes of Sam Sharp's trial, which took place on April 19th, refers to Samuel Sharp, slave to Samuel Sharp Esquire of the parish of St. James. The Samuel Sharp Esquire referred to was a lawyer who owned a small property called Cooper's Hill on the outskirts of Montego Bay, in the area where you now have the Cornwall Regional Hospital. Sam Sharp had become a trusted house slave. Consistent with the custom of the day, slaves took the name of their masters. To this day, historians contend as to whether or not the officials who prepared the reward notice and who themselves were most likely ignorant of the man they were describing confused Sam Sharp with John Sharp and Daddy Tharp both local leaders in the rebellion who lived in Catadupa, a rural village adjoining Croydon Estate. The confusion which still prevails as to his identity, birth and early years need not detain us, for we must not lose sight of the fact that slave did not leave written records for posterity. But for the rebellion, Sam Sharp, like so many other African Jamaicans of singular genius, would have lived and died as though they had not been. Yet, if we consider freedom 
to be the single most important asset in our struggle for nationhood, Sam Sharp can justly claim pride of place as the greatest Jamaican of all times. For he more so than any other is the symbol of our transformation from slavery and the architect of our liberation at a most critical point. As to his identity, I am of the view that the Sam Sharp described as a field slave at Croydon is the same Sam Sharp which reappears as a house slave in Cooper's Hill. Why do I say this? The detailed knowledge displayed by Sam Sharp of the interior of St. James in the organization and conduct of the rebellion and his intimacy with the leaders strengthens the official claim that he was born and spent his early years among the slaves on the properties in the hills of St. James that are in close proximity to Croydon. Just let us take a look and see some of these people who were leaders and where they were. There was Dove at Belvedere, Tharp his lips. There were Guthrie at Montpellier. There was Johnson at Retrieve. These are some of the leaders Sam Sharp recruited and their conduct in the rebellion suggests these are people he would have known over a period of time. One fact, however, about which all are agreed is that Sam Sharp lived in Montego Bay for some time before the 1831 rebellion. Indeed, one of the rebel leaders, Robert Gardner, testified that the rebellion had been on their minds since 1824. This date is particularly significant for the fact that on the 28th of January that year, 14 slaves from the Unity Hall and Spring Garden Estates in the parish of St. James were charged with planning to enter into a rebellious conspiracy for the purpose of obtaining by force and violence and by acts of resistance the freedom of themselves and other such slaves. Interestingly, one of those charges went by the name of Croydon. One is tempted to speculate, would this Croydon have anything at all to do with our national hero, Sam Sharp? Given Sam Sharp's central role in the planning of the rebellion, it is entirely likely that he was already working at Cooper's Hill Estate in Montego Bay at this point and would have been a member of the First Baptist Church for which Thomas Burchell had been minister since 1822. Sam Sharp also had other reasons for being in Montego Bay. He was married to a slave at Content, an estate located in the western end of Montego Bay, and from the records that are available, visited her often. His brother William, with whom he seemed to have had a close relationship, also lived in Montego Bay. What was Sam Sharp like? I've always looked at the artistic impressions that are available and in particular the official one. They all tend to portray a balding man fairly mature in age. The description given by the Methodist minister is not consistent with those artistic impressions. And I quote Henry Blebis' description. Blebis speaks of a young man of middle size. His fine sinewy frame was handsomely molded and his skin as perfect a jet as can well be imagined. His forehead was high and broad, while his nose and lips exhibited the usual characteristics of the Negro race. He had teeth whose regularity and pearly whiteness a court beauty might have envied, and eyes whose brilliancy were almost dazzling. Blebin visited with Sam Shaft often while he was in jail and found him the most intelligent and remarkable slave he had ever met. According to Blebby, Sharp possessed intellectual and oratorical powers above the common order. And this was the same Blebby. Sharp possessed intellectual and oratorical powers above the common order. And this was the secret of the extensive influence which he exercised. Reading Blebby's description of Sam Sharp, 
brings to mind one of Sharp's contemporaries, Nat Turner the slave from the state of Virginia and the United States of America, who was born the same year as Sam Sharp and led the rebellion to which his name has been appended four months before Sam Sharp's Emancipation Rebellion in Jamaica. This is how they describe Turner. His moral facilities were very strong and in general so marked were his early peculiarities that people said he had too much sense to be raised as a slave. He fasted, prayed, preached, read the Bible and communicated communicated his revelations to the awestruck slaves. Sam Sharp, what was the international environment in which he was born? What was the world like then? The record suggests Sam Sharp was born in the year 1800 into a world in which slave labor had been the dominant feature of the international economic system for two centuries. By then, the Atlantic slave trade had forcibly brought millions of Africans to the Caribbean and the Americas to be enslaved on estates and plantations, pens and settlements to create immense fortunes for the major European colonial powers. Sam Sharp also was born at a time when the critique of slavery had been fairly well developed. On the economic side, Adam Smith had already published The Wealth of Nations, which asserted that the work done by free men comes cheaper than the work performed by slaves. The British humanitarians had begun their challenge of the slave trade, and on the 22nd of May, 1787, Granville Sharp, Thomas Clarkson, and 10 others, including a majority of Quakers, had formed the committee which evolved into the Abolition Society. Politically, it was a world that was still feeling the effects of the French Revolution of 1789, which shook all the European monarchies and their colonial empires to the foundations. The revolution's advocacy of republicanism, as well as its denunciation of slavery, gave credence to its slogan, liberty, equality, and fraternity. It was in this new international situation which came about as a direct result of the influence of the French Revolution that Toussaint Louverture, himself a slave in the island neighboring Jamaica, San Domingue, which eventually became Haiti, organized and led the most successful slave revolution in history. Under Toussaint, his army of slaves defeated first the local whites and their allies, then the royalist faction of the French army, a Spanish invasion, a British expedition of some 60,000 men, and then set about rebuilding the colony to its former level of prosperity. These were the general activities taking place in the world at the time when Sam Sharp was born. It is also extremely significant although Sam Sharp would not have understood this until much later in his life, that Toussaint was not able to complete the revolution he started, nor rebuild saint domingue to the level of prosperity he would have liked. In 1801, he was kidnapped and exiled to France, and with him out of the way, all prospects for the orderly development and prosperity of San Doman disappeared. The first black republic was then drowned in blood. And the actual manner of it, I would encourage my readers, my listeners, to read and take very, very careful account. Jamaica is just 90 miles from San Doman, and events there were graphically discussed in Jamaica by refugees who kept on coming. Sam Sharp would have been only three years old when the Republic of Haiti was declared. But over time, the events here would impact considerably on his own outlook and approach. From another perspective, if we go now to Southern Africa, at the time of Sam Sharp's birth, this is the time when Shaka Zulu, from his base in Southern Africa, was about to begin his spectacular entry into world history. In the space of 12 years, 
Shakazulu organized an immense army of skilled and disciplined warriors to conquer and pacify a territory larger than Europe. The military experts of Shakazulu certainly rival those of his contemporary Napoleon Bonaparte. Reuniting the African family for development. All right, we return you now to the lecture, the Sam Sharp lecture, Arnold Bertram. And now we come to Sam Sharp's Jamaica. What was the Jamaica in which Sam Sharp was born? For almost a century before Sam Sharp was born, no colony exceeded Jamaica's economic importance to Britain. For much of that century, one twelfth of Britain's total imports came from Jamaica. Sam Sharp's parents were among the 711,000 Africans brought to Jamaica to be enslaved in the period between the English capture of the island in 1655 and the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. I would like to give listeners just one indication of just how cruel a system plantation of slavery was. If we look at the fact that 711,000 Africans came to Jamaica and we assume a normal cycle of reproduction and increase, by the time of abolition, we would have had a population of some 2 million African Jamaicans. Yet, in the year of abolition, the slave population was only 311,000. To take this argument further, from 311,000 in 1834, after abolition, when you have a more normal rate of reproduction and increase, 150 years after, the population did move to 2 million. Who were these slaves? What was the level of training and intelligence? For a very extended period, we have been led to believe that they were in the main ignorant brutes whose first taste of civilization came as a result of their enslavement. Nothing could be further from the truth. The record shows that the slave population included engineers, builders, welders, wheelwrights, shipwrights, in short, practitioners of the most advanced skills in the then known world. The sugar factory was perhaps the most advanced technological process of the day, that's the making of sugar, and the position of head boiler to determine at what point it is taken off was a position normally held by a slave. If we look at some other examples of Shamshab's contemporaries, you get a much better feel for what I'm talking about. Take the case of Francis Williams, a young black man in Spanish town. During the tenure of Governor Trelawney, 1738 to 48, the Duke of Montague decided to carry out an experiment to determine whether a Negro trained at a grammar school and then at a university would be found equal in literary attainments to a white man. Francis Williams was selected for this experiment and dutifully sent off to an English public school and from there to Cambridge University. He did exceptionally well and on his return to Jamaica, his patron proposed a seat for him in the Legislative Council. The governor posed this proposal on the basis that it would affect the willingness of slaves to submit to bondage if one of their own were to be so elevated. Francis Williams opened a school in Spanish Town, taught classical education. When the next governor came, he wrote an extended poem in Latin welcoming him. All to no avail. He never ever got a position in this society. Look briefly at two others of Sham Sharp's contemporaries. Born the same year as Sam Sharp was John Brown Rosserum, a slave in Portland who at 19 years of age left for the United States having been adopted by a Quaker family. He attended first the Hebron Academy in Maine was then later enrolled in college in 1824 and became the first black graduate from an American college. 
Three years later, along with some Sam Cornish, he edited Freedom Journal, the first newspaper in the United States to be owned, operated, published, and edited by African Jamaicans. Take the case on the southern side of Jamaica, Archibald Monteith, an African prince from the Ibos, who was kidnapped at age 12, ended up in Jamaica, and on an estate in St. Elizabeth owned by the Kreps, a Moravian family. Archibald Monteith became a leader of the Moravian church, bought his freedom, gained considerable influence over both the enslaved and free communities in St. Elizabeth. To this day, he's venerated as a leader of that church. Very important for this lecture, how did we build a revolutionary tradition among Jamaican slaves over time? And this tradition, being what Sam Sharp inherited, in what way did it impact or contribute to the success of the Sam Sharp's Emancipation Rebellion of 1831? The historical records certainly support the claim that African slaves in Jamaica were perhaps the most rebellious in any part of the world. Look at the record. The English arrived in 1655. By the time they had established a civil administration and start the first set of plantations, there's record of a rebellion in 1673 in the parish of St. Anne. A contemporary report states that the slaves were able to secure arms and ammunition and about 200 of them retired to the mountains. Two years later, this is 1679, 35 slaves were executed for, t for participating in a conspiracy to rebel. They were at it again in 1676, and before the end of the century, there were slave rebellions at Caymanas, Vare, Guanabo Vale. In a letter dated September 28, 1686, a member of the Privy Council Committee informed his colleagues that the rebel Negroes variously reported as from 40 to 100 have made themselves plantations in the mountains, from which they descend in the plains in great numbers. All this was a prelude to the major rebellion which took place on Sutton's estate in Clarendon on the 29th of July 1690, when some 500 slaves seized arms and ammunition, killed the overseer, and this pattern continued right up to the First Maroon War of 1734. Maroon communities had been established over time by slaves who gained their freedom from the Spanish when the British came in 1655. And by the time of Sam Sharp conducted their affairs as a virtual independent state in a liberated geographical area. Of extreme importance is the treaty arrived at between the Maroons and the British after the First Maroon War. This treaty signed with Kojo at the Maroon camp in Trelawney between 1738 and 1739, listen carefully, obliged the Maroons in return for their freedom to use their best endeavors to take, kill, suppress, or destroy either by themselves or jointly with any other number of men commanded on that service by His Excellency the Governor or Commander-in-Chief for the time being, all rebels, wheresoever they be throughout the island, unless they submit to the same terms of accommodation granted to Captain Kojo and his successors. It is at this point you have the classical point of departure in this divide and rule. The treaty signed between the Maroons and the British required the Maroons to join the British authorities to put an end to any other slave rebellion. So while we accord the respect and admiration the Maroons deserve for their consistent fight against the British slave owners, let there be no doubt that their freedom was achieved in part at the expense of the rest of the black slave population. The eminent historian C.L.R. James makes a very serious observation when he says, political treachery is not a monopoly of the white race. And political
political leadership is a matter of program, strategy, and tactics, and not the color of those who lead it, their oneness of origin with the people, nor past services they have rendered. And this was the background against which we now come to Taki's rebellion in 1760. Before Taki, slave rebellions are to secure the freedom for those who are fought. And in most cases, having fought, seized arms and ammunition, destroyed some property, they have retired to the mountains. Taki's rebellion establishes a different perspective. And from all we understand, Taki aimed at liberating almost the entire North Coast and establishing some kind of rule over that area. The actual conduct of Taki's war, the rail started briskly. Early days they took all before them. The fort of Fort Maria set fire to Haywood Hall, took charge of Esher before doubling back to Ballard's Valley. Defeated the local militia, engaged two detachments of British soldiers, but in the end, the Maroons decided the outcome in favor of the authorities. Takito was reported met his death at the hands of the Maroons, who decollated the body in order to preserve the head as a trophy of victory. The report goes on to express some gruesome details as to how he met his death. But in the planning, scope, and the objectives of the rebellion led by attack in 1760, we see a prelude to Sam Sharp's Emancipation Rebellion of 1831. From freedom for those who fight to running away in the hills, we have Taki wanting to preside over a liberated area on the plains, and then Sam Sharp who establishes a difference with all previous rebellions by fighting for freedom for all, full emancipation. One other aspect that we come to of the early rebellions and why so many of them ended without achieving the objective set out has to do with the divisions between slave communities at the time in Jamaica. Delivered by Arnold Bertram, November 5, 2006. I would just like to spend a minute on the divisions which existed among the African slave community at the time. We must not lose sight of the fact that enslaved Africans, many of them the Europeans were able to get because of warring tribes in Africa. Don Robotham, the eminent sociologist, reminds us that not much imagination is needed to realize that whatever the historical roots of those hostilities in Africa, the fact of being sold into slavery, sometimes by members of the self-same group, they now confronted in the Caribbean as fellow slaves could only have intensified the ill will which had emerged between traditional ethnic groups. Recrimination and individualism rather than solidarity and cooperation were thus what characterized the initial phase of enslavement in the Caribbean. By the time of Sam Sharp, an environment had been created for greater cooperation. And a major factor in this new environment was the work of the missionary churches, to which I now come, and in particular, Sam Sharp's relationship with the Baptist Church. The, the Moravians were the first European missionaries to arrive. They came in 1754. And it is with them that the exposure of enslaved Jamaicans to Christianity began. The native Baptists were the next to arrive when George Lyle 
a slave from the state of Virginia in the United States of America, who was ordained a minister as early as 1775 and who fought on the side of the British in the American War of Independence. In order to escape the threat of re-enslavement, accepted a suggestion from a Baptist officer that he go to Jamaica where there was a large black population waiting to be ministered unto. Lyle arrived in Kingston in 1782 and began preaching on the Kingston race course. In spite of sustained persecution, Lyle was able to baptize some 500 persons within seven years and in 1791 built the first Baptist church in Jamaica at the corner of Victoria and Elsa Road in Kingston. That same year, the Second Baptist Church was established, this time in Crooked Spring in the parish of St. James, by Moses Baker, who had also been enslaved in the United States and came to Jamaica. Baker traveled to western Jamaica on the invitation of Lassell's Wynn, a Quaker and owner of a Delphi estate in St. James. Wynn had gone to Kingston to buy some slaves, many of whom belonged to Lyle's Church. And to provide for their continued religious education, Wynne secured the services of Baker. Baker and Lyle then invited the English Baptists to send a missionary to assist them, the first one coming in 1814. But it is with the arrival of Thomas Burchell in 1822 that the expansion of the English Baptist Church began. But already there was a native Baptist church, an African Jamaican church within an African Jamaican cultural tradition. I must say something about the organization of the Baptist church because it was this organization that Sam Sharp was able to tap into to develop the revolutionary organization which conducted the 1831 rebellion. From the Methodists and the Moravians, the Baptists learned the principles of organization, and the church was organized along these lines. The outer circle, what you call inquirers. After you're an inquirer, and after some initiation, you became a candidate. From a candidate, you became a member. And Within the church, there were such offices as class leaders and deacons. Within the Baptist church, therefore, as a means of controlling the large congregation, tickets were issued to each person indicating whether they were an inquirer, a candidate, or a member. The tickets were renewed quarterly when each slave made his financial contribution and without a ticket, he could neither attend service nor approach the communion table. It was an admirable device. It simplified the collection of money, and the threat of revocation gave the minister a means of discipline over converts. The ticket which was issued by the European ministry, missionary helped him to circumvent the power of the class leaders. The class leader, however, was still the key figure. He had the power of denying admission by giving a bad report. Since with such large congregation, missionaries were forced to rely on their leaders. You just have to see how both the economic and the church organization now interact. On the plantation, there's the headman, or there's the driver, there's the trusted house slave. Within the Baptist church, there's a deacon or there's a class leader. And this is the cadre of leadership that had been built up for 50 years that Sam Sharp inherited. I've listened very often to the discussions as to whether Sam Sharp was a native Baptist or an official Baptist. My own view is that Sam Sharp was both. He was in Burchell's church as a class leader. And he was a daddy in the Native Baptist Church. He had access to both sets of organizations. And when you look at the leaders he recruited, 
there is no doubt at all that he was in touch with everybody. It was his leadership role in both branches of the Baptist Church that facilitated Sam Sharp's extensive contact with large numbers of native leaders, deacons, daddies, elders, and aides, variously named, appointed and mandated to preach Christianity. Over time, these leaders provided the medium through which the slave population encountered Christian teaching, which offered a spiritual freedom helped them to transcend their earthly bondage and in the end provided them with the means of establishing the solidarity and the organization for achieving freedom from slavery in this life. We come now to Sam Sharp's organizational plan. When you look at Sam Sharp's plan for rebellion, first thing to contemplate if we go by the evidence of some of his lieutenants. They started planning as early as 1824 for a rebellion which kicked off in 1831. First aspect of Sam Sharp's preparation, he used every opportunity to improve his own information level. He read the newspapers of the day. From the English newspapers, him, he understood the resolution of May 1830 from the Anti-Slavery Society in England proposing immediate emancipation. Then there was the Watchman newspaper, edited by two freemen of color, Jamaicans Edward Jordan and Robert Osborne, which began publication in 1829. From this newspaper, Sam Sharp developed a far better understanding of the dimensions of the fight against slavery. One of the editorials in the Watchman advocated a long pull, a strong pull, and a pull together for liberty. In preparing, Sam Sharp would also have to take into account the balance of political forces here in Jamaica. This is very important. In 1831, nearly a quarter of the slaves in Jamaica, or approximately 70,000, were owned by free blacks and Browns and Jews. This view we have that only whites own slaves is not true. Slavery, slave labor, was the mode, an integral part of the mode of production. Blacks, what they did not have was large plantations. But in the urban towns in the capital, Blacks had two, three, five slaves, most of them tradesmen, with whom you could make a very good living. The whites, however, saw the writing on the wall in terms of emancipation. And in 1830, a year before the Sam Sharp Rebellion, the white slave owners passed a bill in December 1830 granting civil rights, including the right to vote, to free blacks and coloreds. The following year, these rights were extended to Jews. What is on the mind of the white planters is an alliance with non-white slave owners to preserve slavery. The intention is not so much to expand civil rights and freedom. And Sam Sharp would have to take into account this changing political balance of forces. In 1831, the first year after these rights, you have John Manderson being elected in Montego Bay. This is the first brown man who is going to enter the Legislative Council. And you get an understanding of the reins of Sam Sharp's intellect. I have no doubt Sam Sharp would have been involved in this campaign. Because at the time of Sam Sharp's arrest, as unpopular as it would have been for Madison, who was a conservative, he was one of the people who identified himself with Sam Sharp. So, in preparing, you get a view of Sam Sharp taking into account the different forces. There's a slave army. He's making contacts among people of color who are free. 
He's making contacts among church leaders. He's in touch with missionaries. And you see him starting to build this broad base that he puts into operation in 1831. He would also have to take into account the fact of the Maroons. Who are obligated by treaty to fight with the British against any rebellion. And then, of course, he has to take into account the actual coercive power of the colonial state. There's the militia in western Jamaica. The militia formed by planters. The militia is organized in St. James. In all of these parishes, planters get together. And then, of course, now there are the British soldiers who would be deployed by the governor in case a rebellion began. So, Sham Sharp has to take into account the military balance of forces. He has to take into account the political balance of forces. And he's informing himself as to where the state of the struggle for emancipation has reached in England and in Jamaica. It is out of these considerations that Sham Sharp opts for a general strike not a military offensive to start with. What does the general strike do? It allows a broader balance of forces to participate. It does not begin with the destruction of property. It allows free people of color. It allows slaves. It allows sympathizers. You have the broadest range of class forces you can put to simply say, We are withdrawing our labor until there is an end to slavery and you agree to pay wages. While Sam Sharp is preparing the general strike, he's also preparing a military capacity. Because nobody of Sam Sharp's intelligence is going to be deceived that the entire slave-owning edifice is going to simply hand over freedom, hand over their state in society without a fight. And Sam Sharp, in the recruitment of his lieutenants, there is no doubt that he's taking into account this possibility. Vereen Shepard, in a very informative paper published in the Jamaica Journal called Rebel Voices gives us an idea as to some of these leaders that Sam Sharp had. Nearly all of them held positions on the estate, held positions in the Baptist Church. Reading the account of George Taylor, sadly in Montego Bay, the man regarded next to Sam Sharp in terms of influence and leadership. There's no doubt Sam Sharp had assembled the best collection of minds and influence over the slave population that there was. Now let us look at the military side of the preparation. In preparing for the military side, Sam Sharp had a major challenge. Unlike the militia and the British soldiers, he could not practice He could not train. But yet he did have a plan for a rebel military formation of sorts. But this was so rudimentary and inadequate for the task of dislodging an establishment with strong armed forces at its disposal. Sharp's military plan envisioned the formation of a large mobile body of fighters organized in three or four companies and of local units based on a plantation or a group of adjoining plantations. The language of the leaders of the rebellion has a decidedly military tone. They themselves speak of regiments, companies, generals, colonels, captains. In terms of a military strategy, it is clear that Sam Sharp knew he could not fight the British armies in open. And you'll notice In the first round, the estates on the flat in Montego Bay, like Rose Hall, are out of the picture. 
He's concentrating on the same route that he has developed with the Baptist Church of the Interior, where it is possible to wage a guerrilla-style war, draw the regiments up to him. When the British forces come to Montego Bay, they offer the direct opposite. They don't want to pursue Sam Sharp's army on individual estates. They wait until they gather or wait for them in Montego Bay. And you see these two strategies unfolding in the conduct of the rebellion. But Sam Sharp would have had a difficulty in that he can't train soldiers in the open. It's difficult to communicate all the details of a military plan, particularly when you have mobilized the slave population on the basis of a general strike. But as the day approached, the Baptist authorities got wind of what was being planned. And Lib in particular, in Falmouth, got word, and on the 27th, went to Salter's Hill in St. James where a new Baptist chapel was to be dedicated. This was the occasion Nib used to try to demobilize the general strike and the rebellion Sam Sharp was planning. Here are Nib's words to his congregation. I am pained to the soul at being told that many of you agreed not to go to work anymore for your owners. And I fear this is true. I learned that some wicked persons persuaded you that the King of England has made you free. Hear me, I love your souls, and I would not tell you a lie for the whole world. I assure you that it is false, false as hell can make. I entreat you not to believe it, but to go to your work as formerly. Nim got a very solid response from the over 1,000 people congregated for the opening of the new chapel. The Methodists also tried to help to defuse the rebellion. And it is significant that while Sam Sharp had planned to start on the days after the Christmas break with a general strike, it is the same night of Nib's opening of the church at Salter's Hill, December 27th, that the fire is set at Kensington Estate, which brings the whole timetable of the rebellion forward and out of line with Sharp's plan. Whether the man who set it was one of those who had been upset by the talk of the missionaries that there's no possibility of freedom, nothing has been passed, they have been mistaken, they have been misinformed. But with the torching of Kensington, 16 similar fires followed the following day. The general strike was no longer an option, and for the next three months, the rebellion would proceed in a terms of a series of military engagements. By the 30th of December, martial law was declared, and the governor dispatched Sir Willoughby Cotton to Montego Bay with reinforcements. what Sam Sharp's army was arrayed against. On January the 1st, General Sir Willoughby Cotton, the officer commanding the British troops stationed in Jamaica, arrived at Montego Bay aboard the HMS Sparrowhawk. Before him, the HMS Resort had landed with Marines, and right after him, the HMS Blanche with soldiers from Port Royal. Already in the area were the local militias, and close by, in proximity and ready, were the Maroons. Once Willoughby Cotton arrived, he immediately set up a court martial. And he expresses the view. Initially, it is to begin a series of executions to make the rebel army understand that they are fighting for their lives. There's not going to be any mercy. The series of engagements which follow shows Sam Sharp's army 
without the firepower of the regular soldiers, without the training that a regular army has. The strategy being to move from plantation to plantation and see as far as possible getting the slaves that are there to support. Sharp himself was very careful that he did not want to destroy property uselessly, nor did he want to take the life of anyone who did not directly oppose the objectives of freedom. The British armies, the militia, and then supported by the Maroons, are of a different cast of mind. Their whole intention is to terrorize the population. And I'm tempted to just give you a comparison in terms of members of the slave army who are killed. Corpses are left on the road to rot. Other slaves coming by are expected to be terrified. Those that are caught and are subject to a court martial and sentence, the sentences are extremely severe. Let us take a look at some of these punishments. In St. James, 106 slaves tried by court martial, 99 are convicted, 84 sentenced to death. The rest are given these kinds of punishments, 500 lashes, another sentence of 300 lashes, another sentence of 350 lashes. The actual conduct of the death penalties, whether by shooting or by hanging, you get a general impression between January right into February of just a deliberate design to terrorize this slave population, let them know what they're up against, and let them never, ever think of rebelling again. In the middle of this rebellion, the planters came up with a specific kind of response. And on January 26th, they formed what we know as the Colonial Church Union. This organization is in every way a forerunner of the notorious Ku Klux Klan, which appeared in the state of Georgia at the end of the American Civil War. While professing to uphold the Constitution, the Church Union ran directly at the Baptist Church. The first, the new church at Salters Hill, opened on the 27th, was the first to go, set on fire by members of the St. James Militia. On the 7th of February, Nibs Chapel in Falmouth, destroyed, followed by Stuart Town Church, then Burchell's Baptist Church. Right here in St. Anne, the slaves were building the Baptist Church. Five different occasions it was destroyed by members of the militia led by Hamilton Brown, after whom the town is named Markham, and who was the owner of the property at Minard. But the role of the Colonial Church Union during the rebellion and the direct targeting of the Baptist Church and the Baptist populations is something that I think we have not sufficiently understood or studied enough. I come now to Sam Sharp himself during the rebellion. The movements that he's showing is up and down with the army, encouraging as he could, but with the consciousness that having lost the initiative of the general strike, he never ever got back the momentum of the rebellion. But still you have to consider. For Sam Sharp in St. James, to have organized a rebellion in which 60,000 slaves are participating. Not only slaves. A white man, Mr. Ellery, by definition, fought in Sam Sharp's army. There are records of free people of color fighting in the army. Free blacks fighting in the army. This must be a major, major departure in terms of a class alliance of not just slaves, but fighting under slave leadership for the abolition of slavery. 
It's a truly, truly remarkable feat. By March 1832, it was clear the rebellion would not achieve the objective it had set out. And the lifting of martial law was the first indication that the British authorities were satisfied that they had got the upper hand as far as rebellion is concerned. Sam Sharp himself surrendered in early April. Right there, Cabo. Right, so we just had a Roger the Sam Sharp lecture. Granted, it was a repeat from November 5, uh, 2006 by Arnold Bertram. But boy, when you put everything in perspective and contextualize everything, considering where you are this morning, it really does bring the story of Sam Sharp and our story uh, to life. Yes, um, you, 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 you came in and out a while ago, but... Um trying to get the end of what you said. Yeah, man, all, I mean, we, we, heard, we heard that lecture well in sync with all that has been said here today. A lot more, a lot of information um, that, that we never knew coming to the light. And of course, we want to send a special mention to Professor Vereen Shepard. Um, she uh, also, uh, well, in fact, she's the first one, actually. And uh, that one now by Mr. Bertram and, and so on. So it, it, it's all good. It, 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 it's a wonderful um, feeling right now to be here. The citizens are coming out with their numbers. Um, the chant still going on. We're getting our cup of coffee. I, I, I know you would have mm-hmm. wished to be here to get your cup of coffee too. <laughs> <True. laughs> yeah, no, the true, sun true. is all its glory. I mean, the pretty blue skies. I mean, green trees. I love the scenery. And uh, I, I will be taking a tour down by Solo Castle to show the farm now. Mm-hmm. So it's all good so far. And, you know, I mean, we have lots more people to talk to throughout the course of the morning and so on. So it's, we're just here doing our thing and enjoying ourselves and really celebrating the life and, and, and the work of the great that is that is Sam Sharp. That is Sam. That is sharp, yeah. totally. Yeah. Uh, and, and Roger, you just said that the, the, the crowd is really growing there, that people are, yeah. are coming in. And, and, and tell us exactly where you are. Exactly. I know you don't know the area very well, but where are you exactly? Um, I am in Kensington. Um, I'm on, 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 on the corner. We are at, actually at this site that, that was um, set up. The monument um, for, for Mr. Sharp. The national flag has just gone up as well. Um, right. We are right at the corner. And I gather um, we're full of Catholic, and mm-hmm. um, it's about just about half a mile from here. But right here was the main, main um, course of travel. That's why they have the site. This is a historical site right here because, you know, it's just the main course of travel along the way. You can't miss it. All right. Okay, chanting, drumming, singing, continuing Kensington. This is where the first the first flames were lit as we uh, bring to you Flames of Freedom 2014. And, and, and this week, uh, symbolically, it's still burning right now. So. Yes. Yeah, everything is symbolic right now. Everything symbolic there in Kensington. Yes. Roger, we'll definitely be rejoining you after news and sports. Uh, thank you so much. We went to the parliament and they Okay. All right. We're just picking up something from the background there. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roger. Thank you. Um, Roger Hasfall on location in Kensington. This is news from Irie FM, Jamaica's non aligned news voice. Good morning, I'm Cheryl Johnson with the local and international headlines. An immigration official in the Bahamas has been sent on administrative leave pending an investigation into allegations that he raped a Jamaican woman. Reports have emerged that the woman was allegedly raped earlier this week. It's not yet clear if the Jamaican Ministry of Foreign Affairs will intervene in the matter as it's yet to receive official notification of the incident. Citing the similarities to the Shanique Myri case, the Foreign Affairs Ministry, however, indicated that court matters in the Bahamas differ from in Barbados and that the the Caribbean Court of Justice, CCJ, does not have jurisdiction in the Bahamas. The Westmoreland police seized an illegal gun in the grill yesterday. The weapon, an Intratec 9mm pistol loaded with three rounds, was recovered during a cordon and search operation in the resort town. No one was arrested in connection with the seizure. 
A man who allegedly stole goats from a farm in Seaforth, St. Thomas, and was beaten by residents, remains in police. That should be remains in hospital under police guard. Reports are that on Friday, the man stole three goats, slaughtered them, and was about to escape to the carcasses when he was caught by residents. It's reported that the residents beat the alleged goat thief, who was later rescued by police and taken to hospital where he's admitted in stable condition. The man is expected to be charged with the breaches of the Public Health and Butchers Regulation Act. And in news overseas, U.S. President Barack Obama has strongly condemned the killings of two New York City police officers shot by a man who then killed himself yesterday. Ms. Obama said the officers would not be going home to their loved ones, and for that there is no justification. The two were killed while on patrol in Brooklyn. New York's police chief says they were targeted for their uniform. The gunman had posted anti-police messages online amid continuing tensions over police tactics. Finally, the U.S. has rejected North Korea's claim that it was not responsible for a cyber attack on Sony Pictures. North Korea strongly denies carrying out the attack and invited the U.S. to take part in a joint investigation. A senior U.S. security official said North Korea should instead admit culpability and compensate Sony. North Korea strongly objects to Sony Pictures' satirical film The Interview, which portrays the fictional killing of its leader. Kim Jong-un. After the attack and threats, Sony cancelled the Christmas Day release of the film. Those were the local and international headlines. News is next at 11.45. You can go online to irfm.net to view some of the stories. Like us on facebook.com slash News. Follow us on Twitter at irfm underscore news. From the RFM Newsroom, I'm Cheryl Johnson. That was news from IRFM, Jamaica's David Gibson from Clifton, sentenced to death. John Gilling, owned by Mrs. Parncher, sentenced to 36 lashes. Ishmael, alias Billy Grant from Prospect, 100 lashes. James Green, Clifton, sentenced to death. Frederick Gray from Rose Hill, sentenced to 100 lashes. Sam Hilton, from Lambs River, sentenced to 100 lashes. Philip Irving from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. William McIntosh from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 250 lashes. Duncan McKenzie from Flower Hill, sentenced to be transported. William McKinley, owned by S. Whittingham, sentenced to death. Richard McLeod from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to death. James Miller, owned by Dr. Fuller, sentenced to 160 lashes. John Morris from Clifton, acquitted. Coffee, alias Richard Morrison from Rock Pleasant, sentenced to be transported. Richard Shelton from Ducket Spring and Lambs River, sentenced to 200 lashes. Premier, alias Richard Skelton from Co Park, sentenced to be transported. John M. L. Stevens from Sevenage, sentenced to 200 lashes. George Tharp, owned by enslaver George Tharp, sentenced to 150 lashes. Titus, alias George Waite from Richmond, sentenced to death. George Watson from Horton Grove, sentenced to be transported. Robert Whitehorn from Clantarf, sentenced to death. Edward Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Eliza Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to death. Jane Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to be hanged. S. Whittingham from Cow Park, sentenced to be transported. Robert Wigan from Lambs River, sentenced to be transported. Archie Wilson, owned by enslaver Archibald Wilson, sentenced to 150 lashes. John Wiley from Barnside, sentenced to be transported. Robert Morris, owned by Mary Spence, Stewie, sentenced to death. George Murray from Clifton, sentenced to death. Edward Partner, owned by Isabella Partner, sentenced to death. Philip, owned by William Shellett, sentenced to six months imprisonment. Henry Cooper from Cow Park, sentenced to death. Henry Cowan from Argyle Pen, sentenced to death. Robert Davis from Sweet River, sentenced to be transported. Thomas Davis from Enfield, sentenced to be transported. Matty, alias Richard Drackett, owned by Mary Torrent, acquitted. John L. Laurie, owned by a white sailor, 
sentenced 14 days imprisonment. Hugh Ferguson from Clifton sentenced to death. William Ferguson from Clifton acquitted. Jack, alias John Fleming, owned by Daniel McGibbon, sentenced to 50 lashes. William Evans, alias Alexander Bentloss, from Welshpool Plantation, sentenced to death. William Brooks, Edward Bart, from Ducket Spring and the Lambs River Plantation, sentenced to death. John Bull, owned by Edward J. Young, sentenced to death. John Campbell, from Floor Hill, sentenced to 120 lashes. William Chambers, owned by Mary Gray, sentenced to death. David Clark, owned by a Mr. Young, sentenced to 120 lashes. Samuel Jarrett from Crow Park, sentenced to death. Amelia Johnson, acquitted. Nelson Carr from Belfast, St. James, sentenced to 150 lashes. Edward Lambden from Barneyside, sentenced to death. Robert Lambert, owned by William Shillette, Esquire, sentenced to 39 lashes. John Linton from Heritage, sentenced to death. Joe Little from Welchpool, sentenced to be hanged but mercifully escaped. James Reed from Hermitage, sentenced to death. Thomas Reed from Lambs River, sentenced to 150 lashes. James Ricketts, owned by Edward J. Young, sentenced to death. Thomas Rook, McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. Samuel Sampson, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 14 days imprisonment. William Martin from Cow Park, sentenced to be transported. A.C. McHale from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to death. George McHale from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 100 lashes. John McCallum from McHale's Prospect, sentenced to 60 lashes. Robert McGee from Cow Park, sentenced to 200 lashes. Alexander McGrother, owned by Mary Torrent, sentenced to 200 lashes. James McIntosh, owned by Amelia McIntosh, sentenced to 250 lashes. Richard, alias Richard McIntosh, from Belfont in St. James, sentenced to 100 lashes. Robert Allen, owned by enslaver Isabella Partner, sentenced to four dozen lashes. Jack Anderson, from the Retrieve Plantation, sentenced to death. John Appleton, from the Ducket Spring and Lambs River Plantation, Sentenced to 100 lashes. David Atkinson from Darleston, sentenced to death. William Atkinson, Darleston, sentenced to 100 lashes. David Atkinson from Darleston, sentenced to death. William Atkinson, Darleston, sentenced to death. Fred, alias William Ball, owned by enslaver Mary Malin, sentenced to death. Daniel Barijam from Chillons, sentenced to death. Billy, Alias William Binham from Golden Spring, sentenced to death. We say their names, we say their names, we say their names. Of the gallant. If we forget their names, then we forget the reason for the revolution. We forget the reason for the struggle. We forget the reason. The association, good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, and I gather you want to pay some homage to the president, right? Wesley Falls, Herbie Hearn, Teacher Dan Carter Henry, and Teacher Owens. Mm-hmm. Mrs. McLean, who is among us. The first four names of the car, they are all gone ahead of us. But we have like Miss McLean, who works with the SDC, Mrs. Nelson, that's Ivette Nelson, Mr. Chung, Mr. Asbury Johnson, those were the first persons who start the Welcome Art Citizens Association. Yes. I inherit all what is going on now. Right. So we have to give thanks to all those persons because if it hadn't been for them, we wouldn't be here celebrating the Samshaft. So we have to give a big round of applause to <laughs> the past people. Yes. And I'm almost here. We have one of Mr. Paul's daughter who is here. She is trying to say something. So... Uh, Mr. Paul's daughter. Uh, uh, yes, and adding, adding to that, the member, of Parliament, the member of Parliament, the Honorable Mr. Derrick Kelly, he's not here now, but we intend to meet with him in a few minutes at the San Francisco Baptist Church. Okay. So I want to thank, and behalf of the Welcome Artists Association, 
I want to say thanks to Irish FM, and I hope to see you next year when it's bigger and better. Next week. Oh, no, next week. Next week. Next week. What's your name again? What's your name again? Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm here at the Kensington, the Tolo Castle historical site, the monument at the roadside, and it has been a great morning. I have seen where we have been learning a lot about our um, hero, Sam, Samuel Sharp, known as Daddy Sharp. Yes. And we are happy this morning to know that in 1831 or 1838, when the slavery was abolished, we now are inheriting what has gone, what has happened at that time. I must say a few words about my father. My father was left the community happy today because he has done so much. He has taken out the people, bring them down to Tolo, have a great time with them. He, he started, even though he was a church deacon, just like Sam Sharp, he still did not resist giving the other people who weren't a Christian their chance to enjoy themselves because after the show, he normally had the sound system. Yes. And we are going to continue the whole um, thing by educating the community with a computer center which should be erected anytime soon and the children will benefit from it. I welcome IRFM again and I hope to see everybody out on the 27th where we shall have a grand time with Pop Five. Thank you very much. Remind your name again? Joy Clayton, Paul Clayton. All right, thank you very much. You have to stop that. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I want to welcome my race family. I thank the in my community of Kensington Point. And I hope someday we'll get water in our pipes. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. We just want to mention Rumpton, Rumpton District, Rumpton Greatest was also. A place that burned up in the 1832 rebellion, 1831 rebellion. Yeah. And how oh, this uh, was like the town of in the time. And Rwantan and Montpella is both archaeological study done by the University of the West Indies. So this heritage tour and whole thing, we're, in, in, we're looking forward to increase the momentum and teach you in schools, all right? Let's talk uh, to the care and give it All my friends in England, it's I, I, Mabriak, all right? All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, give us some, give us some party. Give us some party. Give us some party. Give us some party. Give